Hello everyone, my name is Fatma Gaydon. I'm your stroke coordinator here at West Florida Hospital. And my background is that I've been working here at West Florida Hospital for 19 years. I'm a former cardiac nurse, now working as a stroke coordinator for the last five years. I'm very passionate about stroke, and uh, we're gonna, during this hour, we're gonna find out more about stroke and what is our responsibility as a healthcare provider for our stroke patients in, the, in their care, also transition into the uh, community, back to community. As a primary, certified primary stroke center by the Joint Commission, we have uh, certain guidelines that we have to obey by. And, uh, and those include our process changes as the evidence is changing. And uh, those are reviewed with uh, neurologists, physicians, during our quality improvement team, they review and the order sets will be updated into our policy and then uh, process uh, will be implemented. So we provide evidence-based care for our patient to achieve the best outcome. So just a quick review. We're gonna talk about first, how to identify stroke, we're, um, uh, how to uh, recognize an acute stroke, someone who's having an acute stroke, you know, signs and symptoms. The easiest way you may have known the term FAST, F-A-S-D. F is for facial droop, A is for arm drift, uh, S is for slurred speech, T is for time. The new uh, evidence is showing that we need to add B and E because B for balance, E for eyes. It includes posterior, and uh, posterior as well as the anterior circulation deficit coverage. Uh, sudden onset of balance changes, sudden onset of vision changes, visual deficit cut, or uh, double vision. Those are changes that could be contributing to a stroke. And our patient, uh, when they present to us, we need to be aware of that so we can act fast. And then adding um, FAST acronym, uh, F is for facial droop, like I said, A for arm drift, by simply testing the patient and then um, implementing and activating the stroke alert. So when someone is coming to our triage, and uh, our patient presenting with any of those symptoms, uh, we should be acting stroke alert, activating the stroke alert. Before you activate that, we need to find out additional information from our patient. First, when did the symptoms have started? And when was the last known normal? When it was the patient seen normal? Sometimes our patient is not gonna be able to provide that information to us. So we may have to ask family or if our patient is coming from a nursing facility, a nursing home facility, call them and get the information because it's critical in the treatment of our stroke patient to identify and pinpoint the uh, actual last known normal, last known well for our patient. So, stroke is an emergency, acting fast, uh, utmo, you know, after uh, recognizing the signs and symptoms, we have established last known normal, and that determines if we're gonna call stroke alert. Here at West Florida Hospital, we call stroke alert from last known normal eight hours, and that includes uh, for wake up strokes to capture those uh, patients, as well as um, a large vessel occlusion that may be uh, not a candidate for TPA patient, but they may qualify for clot retrieval. So to include all of those patients, so any patient presenting to us with acute sudden changes with neurological, neurologi neurological deficit, we will call a stroke alert from last known normal, and then first step is you know, taking the patient to an emergent uh, CT, and, um, and then uh, calling the neurology, the services, uh, activate in our emergency room we call uh, acute stroke alert with that one call system um, our calling the call center with star 4411 you're initiating the stroke alert and with that stroke alert CT is notified stroke coordinator is notified the physician is aware of that and then your uh, secretary will notify the teleneurology services for neurological evaluation of that patient Time is of the essence, time is brain, and uh, we need to uh, expedite the uh, care. So our patient, um, you know, I, like I mentioned, you know, our patient is gonna qualify either for IVTP, and I'm talking for ischemic stroke, and uh, you know, what do we do if our patient is in hemorrhagic stroke, which is ICH and subarachnoid hemorrhages? In those instances, you know, we may have to 
evaluate our patient, you know, for the neural, neurosurgery coverage, neurosurgery services. And if it's a surgical candidate, uh, we most likely will transfer our patient where the services are available. Um, at West Florida Hospital, we have neurosurgery services at limited time, not at 24-7. So that will be determined by the ER physician when the patient presents. And uh, if we have to transfer the patient, we'll have that conversation with the patient and uh, transfer them as quickly as possible because of, again, uh, blood pressure management and uh, uh, further management of cerebral edema is of, uh, is, is of the essence and is critical for that patient's good outcome. And then you know, we, if the patient qualifies for IV thrombolytic therapy, uh, certainly we're going to uh, provide that. And then endovascular therapy to rule out if patient is going to uh, qualify for thrombolytic uh, thrombectomies or clot retrieval. So uh, once we identify then you know, we're working up the patient, patient had the CT, we need to look at the vital signs. Most of the time your stroke patient is going to present with extremely high blood pressures and that blood pressure has to be managed before we can give IV TPA to our patient as well as even if it's a hemorrhagic stroke, again the blood pressure management is different for each of those cases. So we have three tiered blood pressure management in the care of an acute stroke. So if your patient presenting with a hemorrhagic stroke, the guideline is that we manage, need to manage the blood pressure to a goal rate of systolic blood pressure less than 140. And the two medication that's available to you to administer is levetolol IV push, which will bring the blood pressure quickly down. And then to manage it, you want to hang cardian drip to gently control the blood pressure, not to have fluctuations um, of highs and peaks. In ischemic stroke patients, if our patient is a TPA candidate, uh, in order to give the TPA safely, we need to bring the blood pressure down to systolic blood pressure less than 185, and diastolic blood pressure needs to be less than 105. And again, in those cases, we have the two medications that we have to treat treat them before we can give TPA safely. And again, the reason we have to manage the blood pressure in the case of TPA patient is so we will not have hemorrhagic conversions. So our ischemic stroke is not converting into a hemorrhagic stroke. The blood pressure uh, from the studies have shown if we bring the blood pressure below 180, uh, that the likelihood of that happening is very low. And but if our patient is not TPA candidate and they're having their stroke or uh, completing their stroke, in that case, the guidelines is indicating actually that the blood pressure to be 220 or one um, diastolic blood pressure 120. So if systolic blood pressure is around 180 when they presented, so it is safe to keep the patient in that range, 180 to 200, 220. We wouldn't be treating it. Uh, unless it's greater than 220. Again, and the reason for that is we need to have permissive hypertension. Brain perfusion, the br brain is, th does need the perfusion in order to survive. So blood pressure is elevated and, uh, and it is safe and you may even notice it when you bring the blood pressure too low. Patient symptoms could extend and the stroke could extend as well. And we're running the risk uh, for a hemorrhagic conversion if we keep the blood pressures too high. So it's really a very fine balance and, uh, and that's why it requires a, our immediate attention and monitoring of an acute stroke patient. So our target goal is gonna be you know, 150 over 90 for all of those patients. Um, again, but not to lower the patient's blood pressure too fast immediately. It really needs to be a gradual lowering. So additionally, we want to check blood sugars. Blood sugars, as you know, high or low, could mimic stroke symptoms. Hypoglycemia, uh, you may have experienced, could exhibit, your patient could exhibit you know, in a hypoglycemic event, just like the stroke symptoms with facial droop, slurred speech. And for that reason, we, uh, our first action after the CT completion, our vital signs should include blood sugar monitoring. And uh, 
Actually, one of the exclusions is actually when the blood pressure is too low, well, less than 50, uh, needs to be treated and that patient shouldn't be a TPA candidate because uh, the symptoms could be contributed from the hypoglycemia. Same goes for hyperglycemia. If your blood sugars are greater than 400, and that could be stroke-like symptom as well. And uh, again, that patient could be having uh, symptoms related to their hyperglycemia, and that's not a good candidate. And even during the management of the acute stroke, we need to be conscientious about managing the blood pressures, blood sugars better. Uh, any hyper, euglycemia is our goal to keep it around uh, less than one around 140. Um, and uh, if our patient is diabetic, obviously they're going to be on AccuCheck. But regardless if they're diabetic or not our patient is gonna, we will be monitoring the bedside glucose testing uh, at least for 24 to 48 hours. And our testing also include hemoglobin A1C later. But in the, in the emergency room, our immediate action is going to be blood sugar, bedside blood sugar testing. And then obviously heart rate monitoring and uh, oxygenation. Typically your acute stroke patient is not gonna have any respiratory distress or uh, difficulty with saturation, unless it's a brainstem stroke. But in this case, you know, majority of our goal is to keep oxygen saturation greater than 92%, uh, but not to be exceeding um, more than 94% or 99%. So uh, just be conscientious about too much oxygen is not good either for our patient. And then uh, heart rate, if they are presenting with bradycardia, and that is a new change, and that could be the sign and symptom for stroke. But again, we have to work it as a stroke until we rule out that is not a stroke. And temperature is also of the essence to monitor. Any fever uh, associated with stroke-like symptoms, it is uh, related to worse outcomes, but that doesn't mean they're not having a stroke, but just be uh, conscientious about that and monitoring it for uh, normothermic, normothermia, that should be our goal. So in the acute presentation, when the patient is coming to the emergency room, here is the stepwise uh, action. They're going to present to you in the ED, or you may get a, actually you know, from a call from EMS. Our EMS calls stroke alert from the field, and in that case, when EMS presents our patient, they will go directly to, uh, to CT for brain imaging. We want to rule out bleed. That is not a hemorrhagic stroke. And also, we don't want to see any signs and symptoms, uh, or any sign of stroke on the first imaging. If that is the case, then uh, most likely that's not an acute stroke. Uh, our patient will not qualify for TPA. So determine. So, uh, recognize the symptoms and determine the last known normal are the first initial uh, two questions that we have to answer. And then if it is within the last eight hours from last known normal, then we're going to call a stroke alert, initiate our stroke alert by calling 4111. And then uh, the ABCs are obviously and make sure airway is patent and uh, make sure your patient has IV, at least two IV accesses. Uh, in case TPA is given, then we want to uh, assure that we will not be sticking the patient for the uh, unnecessarily. Um, with TPA, your patient will be on 24-hour uh, restriction for re-sticking again, and lab draws could be taken from the uh, second access. Then, obviously, we're going to get blood sugar testing to rule out hypoglycemia, and uh, CT either presented by ED, they will already have that, or if patient came in from triage, we will take our patient directly to the CT. Then uh, next step is gonna be uh, taking a quick evaluation of the patient, medical history, medication profile. It's important and it's usually uh, physicians, physician are there with you present, evaluating the patient quickly. That typically has to happen within the first 10 minutes. Quick evaluation of the patient, um, and then a uh, quick assessment, you know, finding out medical history and medication. And then facilitating teleneurology. All of our emergency room patients will have a, uh, when, uh, for acute stroke, um, if the physician, ER physician decides to, they want to have a neurology recommendation, 
we alert teleneurology at the same time when we call a stroke alert. If the physician decides not to complete the neuro evaluation, that is okay, but we made it part of our process to eliminate delays in, the pa in patient's care. And then complete a full NIH stroke scale evaluation. Uh, that is part of the uh, before TPA, especially we're giving TPA, to have it available. And then uh, bedside swallow testing uh, can be done later, but that is part of the process as well. But our first utmost important is the um, IV, make sure we have the CT, and then evaluation of the patient's uh, some medical history and medication. And this is a brief timeline for you uh, of, the, of what our stroke alert goals should be. And uh, some of these are actually joint commission recommendations. So from arrival to 10 minutes, patients should be evaluated by the physician. From arrival to CT, uh, it should take us only 25 minutes, and then another 20 minutes for uh, resulting the result, and then labs. Uh, drawing the labs and resulted. All of our imaging and labs should be resulted within 45 minutes from arrival. I know that uh, may sound like a long time, but it really goes by very fast. Goal is to administer the TPA in less than 60 minutes. And this is achievable, actually, uh, currently, our year-to-date average for door-to-needle at West Florida Hospital is 52 minutes. Our shortest time is 25 minutes from arrival uh, that we gave the TPA. And uh, these are excellent times, and the, because we know the sooner we give the IV TPA for our patient, the outcomes are better for our patient. Um, the literature indicates that when we give TPA within the first three hours from symptom onset, that 30% of those patients will go home with uh, minimal or no neurological deficit, and that's what we want for our patients. Here is, uh, again, quick evaluation. The inclusion-exclusion criteria for TPA will be completed by the physician, and we have these cards available, laminated, uh, we have a stroke kit in the ED. This is inside the folder. In that folder, you will find uh, all the necessary paperwork that is need, uh, required for you to complete, as well as uh, education assistance uh, for um, educational tools for the physician to go over with the patient uh, that the patient needs to have an informed consent before giving the TPA. And one of them is inclusion-exclusion criteria that the physician will go over. And these are uh, laminated cards that's available to us, uh, to you in the emergency room in our stroke folders. And, uh, uh, and this is the formal uh, paperwork that needs to be completed by the physician. And uh, again, this is already printed. It's inside your stroke kit, so you don't have to really go in and out the room printing it. It's already available. We have. Uh, several folders, so every time when we have a stroke alert, all you have to do is grab that folder and all your paperwork is included in that folder. And uh, once you give the TPA, and this is the documentation for neuro checks and vital signs, uh, when TPA is given, the requirements, the guideline indicate that patient needs to be monitored every 15 minutes and uh, uh, with blood pressure, heart rate, pupils, and the neurological evaluation. And this paper form gives you an abbreviated NIH. So before you give TPA, you will do a full NIH, and then during administration, every 15 minutes, you will do an abbreviated. And after TPA is completed, you will do another full NIH stroke scale assessment and documentation of that. And, uh, but this form all serves two purposes. One that uh, we know uh, we have better compliance with the paper form. And, um, and secondly, when your patient has completed the TPA and going to critical care for an admission, uh, this form should be used as a handoff communication to you will do a full NIH stroke scale certification together uh, with ongoing nurse of the ICU or a CCU, and then you perform the last NIH stroke scale certification with the patient to communicate the deficits uh, where patient were, was and uh, either improved or worsened, so you can discuss that, that we don't have any 
uh, large variation in our assessments. Um, here is a, just the a, uh, example of the CT scan. We should not be having any uh, scans like that when we're giving TPA. The one on the uh, left is an ischemic stroke, already old, and the one on the right is a hemorrhagic stroke. And uh, I'm going over TPA eligibility again, um, but I'm not going to you know, discuss, go through all of them. You know, some of them that uh, you need to be aware of is, again, blood pressure is the main, and then uh, CT visibility shouldn't be uh, already on our CT. It should be normal, no bleed. But uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time about the TPA checklist that's required from the nursing perspective. Um, what it's before we administer uh, TPA safely, we have to calculate the dosage according to uh, what the manufacturer is recommending for an ischemic stroke. The only drug approved for acute ischemic stroke is Altaplace or Activase. And for stroke, that medication is given 0.9 milligram per kilogram, so it's weight-based. I know Altaplace is also approved for pulmonary embolus or MI uh, in the cases, and those dosages are different. So in our Alaris, when you're giving a TPA over pump, and it has to be given over the pump, and um, you have to select ischemic stroke, and uh, you will actually have two uh, selections. Either uh, one will be uh, ischemic stroke, 90 kilo, less than 90 kilogram, and the other one is ischemic stroke, a uh, great patient with greater than 90 kilogram. And the reason for that is you give the TPA weight base 0.9 milligram per kilogram, but the weight is for a maximum dose regard, up to 90 kilogram. If your patient is more, uh, weighs more than 90 kilogram, uh, you will not give more than 90 milligram to the patient. So that's the maximum dose regardless of the weight. And uh, it comes in um, powdered form to, uh, with the sterile water together. And uh, you, uh, the ED nurses usually mix it at the bedside. And then uh, the you know, dosage of the patient is that you have to validate your dosage and the drug with another nurse or another clinician. It could be a physician, clinical pharmacist, or another nurse, like I said. And if the teleneurology is in case, they usually calculate it with you also. And uh, we also have calculation assistance posters in our ED rooms available for you as assistance. And then um, once you validated uh, the dosage, you know, patient has to give us an informed consent that they agreed to have the TPA. And that informed consent, uh, we still require a written consent, you know, physician, uh, discusses the benefits and the risk of the medication and they agree to have the medication, then we'll get a, a written consent from them. And uh, before we can give the TPA, now like I mentioned, you know, please complete an NIH stroke scale assessment and make sure that the blood pressure is less than 185 systolic. And uh, after everything is ready, our bolus, will start with the bolus. So 0.9 milligram per kilogram is uh, your, let's say our patient is 100 kilogram, so I'm going to give the maximum that I will give is a 90. My bolus is going to be, 10% of it is going to be administered as a bolus. As that's an IV push, and then remaining dosage is going to be given over IV pump over 60 minutes. The IV push is 10% uh, uh, of the 90 million, 9 milligram, and then the remaining 91 milligram, you, uh, 81 milligram you will give over one hour via the Alaris pump. So I have a little video just to show you how to mix the TPA and uh, watch the video. Activate should be reconstituted immediately before use and only by aseptically adding sterile water for injection USP without preservatives. This preparation will result in a colorless to pale yellow transparent solution containing Activase 1 milligram per milliliter. Activase may be administered as reconstituted at 1 milligram per milliliter. As an alternative, the reconstituted solution may be diluted further immediately before administration in an equal volume of 0.9% sodium chloride injection USP or 
5% dextrose injection USP to yield a concentration of 0.5 milligrams per milliliter. When diluting, either polyvinyl chloride bags or glass vials are acceptable. The vial should be reconstituted by using the transfer device provided and adding the contents of the 100 milligram vial of sterile water for injection to the contents of the 100 milligram activase powder. Mix with a gentle swirl or slow inversion. Slight foaming upon reconstitution is not unusual. Allowing the solution to stand undisturbed for several minutes is usually sufficient to allow any large bubbles to dissipate. Before administration, the Activase solution should be visually inspected for particulate matter and discoloration. These are the posters I was talking to you about. That is, uh, the posters are available in the uh, room one, two, and three, and also in your med room to assist you with the calculation. And it's just a, uh, how the picture with the transfer device. And please draw out and waste the amount that's not needed for the patient. We want to eliminate overdosage because the medication comes in 100 milligram and you have 100 ml of sterile water, so it's one to one. So where after you constitute, you know, mix the drug, so you have 100 milligram, and the 10, you know, our patient with 90. It requires the 90 milligram dosage, 10, 10 ml or 10 milligram has to be wasted, removed and waste away. Waste. And uh, you want to also hang uh, as a primary tubing, not a secondary. Just, I have a second video for you to just show you how TPA works in the bloodstream. Activase, also known as Recombinant Tissue Plasminogen Activator, or TPA, is the only drug approved by the FDA for treatment of stroke. Growing plaque can rupture, promoting thrombus formation, by activating the coagulation cascade. Platelets and red blood cells aggregate at the site of injury, causing further narrowing of the artery. This impedes blood flow even more and causes turbulence in the artery. It also increases the likelihood of thrombus formation. As the thrombus grows, it causes increased vessel narrowing, leading to partial or even complete occlusion. The occluded artery leads to ischemia and tissue necrosis. When a piece of thrombus breaks off, it's called an embolus as it travels up the artery. During a stroke, ischemia can progress to infarction. Beyond the infarction lies still viable tissue called the penumbra. Cells within the penumbra are potentially salvageable if blood flow and vital oxygen are restored promptly. The penumbra is the focus of fibrinolytic treatment. Now let's look at the thrombus itself. Inside the thrombus are strands of fibrin, the protein that forms a clot. Enmeshed within the fibrin is plasminogen, the inactive precursor of plasmin. Activase is administered by IV infusion within three hours of acute ischemic stroke symptom onset. Activase binds to the fibrin in a thrombus and converts plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin then breaks the strands of fibrin and dissolves the clot. As the clot dissolves, blood flow is restored, and viable tissue may be reperfused. Although the original infarction remains, when surrounding cells in the penumbra are saved or reperfused, function may be restored. Activase, the one TPA for stroke, is the only drug approved by the FDA for this indication. Activase is indicated for the management of acute ischemic stroke in adults for improving neurological recovery and reducing the incidence of disability. Treatment should only be initiated within three hours after the onset of stroke symptoms and after exclusion of intracranial hemorrhage by a cranial computerized tomography, CT scan, or other diagnostic imaging methods sensitive for the presence of hemorrhage. See contraindications in the full prescribing information. All thrombolytic agents increase the risk of bleeding, including intracranial bleeding, and should be used only in appropriate patients. Not all patients with acute ischemic stroke will be eligible for activase therapy, including patients with evidence of recent or active bleeding, recent within three months intracranial or intraspinal surgery, serious head trauma or previous stroke, uncontrolled high blood pressure, or impaired blood clotting. For further information, please refer to the full prescribing information accompanying this video animation. After TPA is completed, and always flush the line with the same, um, same rate that the infusion was going prior to that, and uh, comp uh, follow with a maintenance IV fluid after that f uh, line is flushed. We want to assure, you know, do not throw away the tubing because 
for example, to prime the Alaris tubing, it requires 22 ml. And if you have a, a petite patient had only required 50 milligram of TPA, half of your dosage is in the tubing, and you will be wasting that. So always flush with saline, follow with a saline infusion afterwards, and then uh, hang a maintenance fluid. You know, most of your stroke patients are not going to be able to eat or drink, so they need the hydration. Hydration has been helpful to also manage the blood pressure as well. We don't want to have a blood pressure fluctuation either. So just to wrap up, so we want to uh, complete um, uh, during the monitor, you know, during the TPA administration, you want to continue with your neuro checks, vital signs. At any time, if your patient is exhibiting uh, worsening of symptoms, uh, neurological deficit, or headache, nausea, vomiting, especially in the first 30 minutes, angioedema could be one of the signs, or uh, another is bleeding, a severe headache that they haven't experienced before. So our worry or our uh, first, uh, we want to rule out bleeding. In that case, if you see worsening of symptoms, you want to stop the tube, stop the infusion, notify the physician, and take the patient to CT to confirm that there is no bleed. And uh, your patient should be on, for 24 hours, uh, bed rest, including no medications like antithrombotics, antiplatelets, anticoagulants should not be administered until 24 hours. In 24 hours, we will have a repeat CT to rule out hemorrhagic conversion. And, uh, and after hemorrhagic conversion is ruled out, the patient can be safely put on antiplatelets agent, which is part of the stroke treatment. Our next item is um, STEMI. STEMI patients that uh, you're also going to be seeing in the uh, emergency room. We have a pre-alert system similar to the heart attack. Again, your EMS is going to pre-alert you, calling a STEMI alert from the field. And they will actually fax a 12-lead EKG to you uh, to confirm, you know, by, confirmed by the physician. If the physician confirms that there is a 12-lead EKG, uh, say showing ST elevation, MI, then the physician will alert, uh, initiate the STEMI alert, the cath lab team will be called in so the patient can quickly be transported to PCI. Uh, we'll evaluate the patient quickly in the ED, making sure, but we do not delay the care uh, to confirm get another EKG or a blood work. Um, that can all be completed in the cath lab and uh, we want to assure that as quickly as possible that we get our patient to cath lab. And, uh, you know, one of the items that's, uh, you know, while your patient perhaps could not go right away in the, to the cath lab is aspirin. We want to make sure that our patient receives the aspirin while they're waiting. Aspirin is important, has shown to prevent uh, secondary uh, MI, antiplatelet aggregation is important, and uh, sometimes the cardiologist may even recommend to you to load them up with a second antiplatelet agent, either in the emergency room or they will have it in the cath lab. And fibronitic therapy is a, a thing of the past, but it is part of the uh, standard of care. If there is no cath lab available, you know, PCI available in a facility, then we can give fibronitics like alteplase or tenectase is the other medication that we have available at West Florida Hospital. And uh, in that case, uh, we may have to, you know, give that fibronitic in the emergency room and then the patient will be transferred to CCU or ICU. And there, during their hospitalization, again, our goal is to get to PCI in less than 60 minutes and uh, lab work, patient education, and uh, completion of all, all the imaging, identifying the risk factors, and educating our patient with the signs and symptoms of stroke. And uh, next item is AFib. We're an AFib accredited center. And uh, similar to uh, STEMI, EKG in this uh, disease specific area is utmost importance. Our EKG for our STEMI patient, if they didn't come with the EMS, uh, need to cover that if they came in as a walk-in to triage, has to be completed within 10 minutes. And same goes for our uh, atrial fib patients. When a patient is presenting with 
uh, symptoms like shortness of breath, lightheadedness, racing of the heart. You know, if they uh, complain, you know, that's part of their chief complaint, always be on the lookout, you know, ask the question, do you have atrial fibrillation? Could be a, a new onset or a chronic, but we may have to complete, especially, you know, palpitations, racing of the heart. Uh, confirm it with a 12 feet EKG because 10 minutes goes by very fast and uh, we want to assure we want to be compliant with our regulatory uh, guidelines and then um, you know after 12 feet EKG you will have the cardiac labs that's ordered and uh, cardiac medication to treat the medication uh, anticoagulation uh, not per se perhaps started in the emergency room but you know, that's part of the treatment for AFib as well. You know, but first option is going to be after EKG and lab, you know, controlling the rate, uh, depending on how our patient's hemodynamic condition, either with medication or cardioversion. The uh, option depends on the patient's uh, condi hemodynamic conditions. And then um, anticoagulation therapy is important. We want to prevent, obviously, uh, further uh, problems for our patient. So uh, education, you know, continuous education of our patient, you know, that our patient is aware about their signs and symptoms of atrial fibrillation, and they know their triggers and their treatment options available to them. And uh, uh, knowing their medication when they go home. Um, and part of the treatment for uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, you know, they may, you know, after rate control, follow up with cardiologists, you know, other options available to them. They need to be aware of that and you know, importance of following up with their either primary care physician or cardiologist. VTE prophylaxis. Uh, I apologize rushing through all of these disease specific areas, but uh, VTE prophylaxis, you may say, you know, why do I need to provide VTE prophylaxis in, my, in the emergency room? Uh, well, VTE prophylaxis is important, uh, especially if your patient is going to be admitted and they don't have a room right away. Unfortunately, that is happening more and more. So if you do have a case that patient has been decided to be admitted, but there is no inpatient room available and you're holding them in the ED, we have to provide VT or prophylaxis for them to prevent a PE or a DVT uh, while they're in their hospitalization. So it could be a mechanical prophylaxis or a medication. So if the medication is uh, given, that's, uh, that can be given easily, but sometimes mechanical prophylaxis does uh, cause, uh, bring up some uh, difficulties to get SCDs, but we have made sure that graduated compression stockings are available in the emergency room, so you can apply them and make sure it's documented also. So if your patient is obviously declined to wear or you receive the medication, Make sure it's documented, please, and, uh, and um, do not hold medication because a uh, bec patient declined it or there is a procedure ordered. Always have that conversation or communication with the physician. Let them aware and get an order to hold the medication. Uh, I know there could be a legitimate reason, but we want to make sure that our documentation reflects that the physician was aware of that and it was not our decision to hold it. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, this, is, this covers all the, uh, our quality measures that we provide here at West Florida Hospital. I've covered through for you the stroke, AFib, STEMI, and VTE, and sepsis core measure will be covered to you by Alexa Seeley, our sepsis coordinator. Thank you for your time and welcome to West Florida Hospital.